Throughout my adult life, my focus has been on making the world a more beautiful place. Initially, I pursued this goal as a hairstylist, working on the external appearance of individuals to make them feel more beautiful. However, I wanted more, so I began to shift my focus to helping people make better choices and achieve greater beauty from within. As a transformational life coach, I specialize in helping you identify and change the limiting beliefs that may be holding you back. Join me each week as we discuss, interview, teach, and explore the fundamental principles of healthy relationships. Welcome to Conscious Conversations with Louisa. In today's episode of Conscious Conversations with Louisa, I'm speaking with Sir Alex Stern. One of the reasons I'm so excited you're here is because of the fact that anytime I'm in a room with you, you create such love and safety and a space of that contribution that I am honored being in this world, being with someone like you who is so generous with the way you share your knowledge. And one of the things that I really wanted to touch on today is like, I've been doing hair for 25 years. And one of the things I used to hear all the time behind the chair from all the very successful people is I had to be a shark in order to make it in the world of success. And I'm so grateful you're not a shark. I'm so grateful that you're a loving, successful person who's here and contributing to have a gigantic list of all of the successes and things that you have accomplished in this life. An entrepreneur, a speaker, a mentor, an inventor, and you have had eight startups, five, two IPOs, three accusations. I can't, I, you, I'm going to start from Alec. Say hello to everyone. Introduce yourself. So Alec Stern, known as America's Startup Success Expert. This is Bo, gentleman Bo, right here, who just turned one. <laughs> And uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's been uh, my bright light this year. And so, uh, yeah, so, you know, eight startups, five exits. Uh, I've got six new startups that I've, in the last two years, uh, I'm a co-founder of six new companies, just rocking and rolling, spent half my time going around the world speaking and starting businesses and part of a venture fund and a bunch of other things. And so... Most of it's, uh, you can find most of it at alecspeaks.com, A-L-E-C speaks.com. So I won't take, I won't take the time up on that. Yeah. So I'm here to answer any questions that you have. I love it. So so time. One of the things I really was thinking about is who's Alec as a teenager? Cause I do find that some of the things that I, the qualities that I have today were really qualities I, I had as a child. So who's Alec as a teenager? Yeah, yeah. Let me, I'm going to put him down. He's, he weighs Hi. too much. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, buddy. There you go. Oh, sorry about that. Didn't drop him on his head, don't worry. No animals were hurt. <laughs> I was not worried. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, I, I guess I'd say a couple of things. I mean, I, I often have heard that, you know, someone, a folk say to me, sorry, I forget the light, right? You know, were you born with a silver spoon in your mouth? And, and the, re the real answer is I was, this is actually my childhood spoon. But the, the difference here is that my mom bought it at a flea market. <laughs> so, yeah. So my mom, you know, my mom was an entrepreneur. She, she had started her own business. My dad was, my dad was involved with over 100 patents. He was a very bright man, but was had that kind of analytical mind and and honestly was wasn't really present. So I really gained a lot from my mom and you know we we were provided for and if if I ever wanted anything I, I had to go you know find a way to make the money to buy it myself. So I became an entrepreneur at 8 and uh, controlled the neighborhood for snow shoveling, lawn cutting, car detailing, and odd jobs in the neighborhood and had all the younger kids working for me and convinced the neighbor who had a dairy farm, the kid that used to come plow their driveways. I said, I, listen, I have all these driveways. If you, I'll give you 10 bucks a driveway. And he's like, 10 bucks. I'm like, you know, I'm not making that much money. I was making 60. 
but I had to pay the other kids, you know, and he, and I said, look, if you, you could make a hundred bucks with 10 driveways in no time. So I jumped in, in the, you know, the plow, plow with him and we went and he would do the driveways for me. <laughs> so my job was easy. And then I just had to do the sidewalks and the cleanup. But yeah, I just learned that early. And I mean, as a teenager, you know, my, you know, I was, you know, an athlete and very successful and, you know, and football and track and, you know, played all the sports. And, but, you know, I had a, one of those defining moments in life. Yeah, I broke my back my senior year and had to learn how to walk again. So I had a path from being recruited to play college ball and, you know, set this whole course ahead of me and I just had the rug pulled out. So I learned, I learned early in life, you know, that, you know, you might have a course set and put your blinders on to what you think that is and it can be taken away at any, any time. And I've had that happen several times in my life. And so... You know, for me, you know, I mean, I guess it just strengthened me to to not only set it, set, set my course and what I'm focused on, but question and challenge it and make sure I'm on the right path. And so I, I learned very early in life to do that. Just just when I had that happen to me a few times. So so I was a I was a I was a I lived in a very sleepy town and. I caused a lot of trouble, but I never got arrested and didn't do any permanent damage to anything. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I wonder if like the children who are a little bit more curious tend to be more successful in life than the ones who follow the rules and stay under the radar. So (laughs) what were your parents like when if it, let's say you did something that didn't go along with what they thought of. Or so when the police come to the house looking for me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. but I usually make sure my sister answered the door. <laughs> so you have a uh, sister. How many other siblings? I just had one older sister who was, you know, was not very supportive. But I, in those rare moments when I needed her, she was she was there. But, but it was more of a challenge than it was a support, I guess. But my, my dad was, he traveled a lot with business. So I usually had about an eight week window when he was away to, you know, be really nice for two weeks, cause, cause a lot of trouble for four and be nice again for two weeks. And he never learned anything that I did. But I just, you know, I was just always having fun with, with the neighbors. And, you know, when one neighbor says, you know, we're going to put a for sale sign up on the house, but since you're going to college, we decided to stay. <laughs> wow. I was just, you know, I was just, a, I had a creative mind and I just, you know, played tricks on everyone and whatever. And but I got, I got, I got all of my, you know, the, my drive and I saw, I saw what not to, honestly, I, you know, I saw what not to be as a man from my dad. And I saw what I needed to be as a, as a person for my mom. Wow. That's pretty huge. So. That's pretty huge. From one, I remember a couple of years ago, I was driving in my car and I remember hearing from a book I was listening to, you're a badass at making money. And if I could do it, you could do it. It was that book. And I remember thinking, if she could do it, I could do it. What would I do? And I remember thinking, I'm going to be a coach. And I, in that moment, driving the car, I called someone and said, here's what I want to do. Would you support me in like teaching me? And that is that moment started, what was a moment for you that, that is a defining moment of, I want to do this and in this, and where were you, what did you do right after? And through the creative process, what was like when you hit brick walls and because it doesn't go from here's an idea and here, here's an execution. Like it actually goes through a process. So what was the idea and what was the process that you rode the idea through? Yeah. So, I mean, it started for me very early in life, but, uh, you know, the first moment for me, which, you know, I, I often shake my head and just can't believe that I would even do this, but there was this, I, I was in a marketing class and I, and I studied a company called Prime Computer, which was one of the, the first mini computer company ever. And it was up here in Boston. I was in, in New, New Jersey at the time going to Syracuse and did a case study on them in college and loved the company. And I said, I'm going to call them. I want to work for them. 
So I called the company and they're like, well, we don't hire anyone unless they have five years experience or more. There's a local sales office you know, in New Jersey. Why don't you talk to them? And I said, no, I want to talk to you about hiring me right out of college. And, and I like, who's ahead, of, who's ahead of sales? Long story short, but there was a senior, senior VP of sales, Marvin Kirby, who, who was worldwide sales and marketing you know, for a public company with a thousand plus employees. And I convinced, you know, got through three executive assistants to the last one who finally said, look, I'll give you 15 minutes with them. So I drove up literally and had a 15 minute interview. Long story short, I, they went, I met the whole C-suite and convinced them to start a recent college grad program. And, and I was first. And they put me in the education department to go through all the trainings and what, what, what worked for me and what, what didn't make sense to me and what would I change you know, for other kids and created, creating a program for recent college grads, which they went on to hire over 100 a year. But the, and I ended up that first year you know, working in the education department. They said, well, where do you, what office do you want us to place you in in sales and, and business development? I'm like, I want to stay in Boston. So they placed me into a Boston office. My first day on the job, I go into the, to see the boss. He's like, shut the door. He's like, you are a liability to me. I could have hired someone with five years experience or more. And now I'm stuck with you and I'm not going to babysit you. Like that, that, was, that was our opening conversation. He said, I'm going to give you a desk. I'm going to give you some accounts and you're not to bother any of the reps or me. You got to figure it out. So I was, you know, I, I could even, you know, do I leave? Do I quit? Or do I prove them wrong? You know, and so I was the rookie of the year for the company against 800 salespeople and one of the top, one of the top 30 or 40 in the company. So I won two trips to go to, you know, to go on, to go to Palm Springs and Hawaii for two different trips for awards trips. And of course, all the executives are like, our protege, like, this is amazing. We hired this kid and he blew away all these people with all this experience. And, and it was in spite of this guy, honestly. And I befriended one of the other salespeople and just said, well, I just, these people want to buy from me. What do I, what paperwork do I have to give them? <laughs> You know, like I honestly knew I I had no guidance. And so she sort of guided me. He ended up going into corporate and she became the boss of our, you know, our, of our, our branch, if you will. And, you know, I was, you know, uh, so I, so I had a friend, a secret friend in in the business who became the boss who was, you know, so from there, there was smooth sailing for, for a great career. But I just, to finish that, that story, I, um, I was at Palm in Palm Springs standing with all the executives and they're all patting themselves on the back and like me on the back and just like, this is so incredible. And anyone who got, who got, who won the trip, the boss came along. So my boss was there. And so he came up to this circle of all these executives and he's like, look at, you know, here's, here's my young protege, you know, didn't he do amazing? And I said, excuse me, I hate to, can I just have a moment? I'm like, you on the first day, and I repeated what he said to me. And put, I said, you threw me out there and said to, to not, you're not babysitting me and you don't want me to, to bother you or anyone else. So I did this on my own. Uh, thanks to you. And so all the executives were laughing and thought it was the funniest thing. And he turned bright red and walked away. And I'm like, I, I, I didn't care. <laughs> I absolutely love that. But you know what? I do think about I when I was growing up and this owner of the salon looked at me one day and he said, you know what, Louisa, and anything I give you is gravy. You got to go figure it out. This it's all on you. And I learned how to figure it out. And I would think one of those things are what be, make us who we are. Yeah. And yeah. But I do also think you as a teenager and what you were doing with the driveways, the kids and that sets you up for yeah. the ability to say, here's what I'm going to do. But I, you know, when I had a defining moment to like basically learn how to walk again and, you know, how to, today we're going to get step up on a curb. And, you know, like I had a lot of time to think and I said, you know, like it's another one of those, that was like one of my big first defining moments of like, you know, do you quit? Do you give in or do you, you know, push through? And I've had many in my life, like everyone thinks, you know, it's so rosy you know, start a business, go public, like, oh, wow, you just did it again. Like, how hard was that? You know, you know, <laughs> you know, I, while you're doing that, and then you have some other conflict hit, you know, in your life that, you know, cancer, dying on the operating table and a routine surgery, I have a lot of things that hit. And it was like, I'm not letting these stop me. Like, you know, I, uh, she up there wants me to stick around and I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a, make a mark, you know, on this world. So, so, I, you know, 
you know, it's not, it's never been, it's, it's never, and I'm not sitting here with this rosy, you know, it was just all handed to me. It was very easy. It was very hard. I, you know, that first example of, you know, uphill battle, I'm like, bring it, you know, like whatever it takes, I'm going to plow through it and figure it out. And, and I think that, you know, that just that in an innate, you know, you know, at all costs, like figure it out. You know, there are a lot of people that love to say they're an entrepreneur, but when the, when the, when stuff hits the fan, they're like, I'm out of here, throw the towel in and go like that. Yeah. You know, I, I would, you know, I, I look and I've invested in people that, you know, I see, well, like if there, if a problem hits, they're going to say, they're going to stay there and figure it out. And, you know, tell me on a Friday, there's a major issue. And on Monday, like we solved it, like right. they worked all weekend, sleepless weekend because they just were, you know, they were, they were, you know, defined to just, you know, find the solution. And you that's how I've, I've always been that way. Like I don't, and you said it at the beginning, you know, you just, you know, don't want to hear no. And they weren't saying no to you. My mantra is a no means not now. So I never hear no. And, you know, if someone says no to me. It's just not now. It's not, it's not a no. And, and I'll ask for feedback as to why they said no. And I, I guarantee you every time, you know, someone says no to you, I was, it was either what you said, how you said it, or when you said it. So they weren't ready to receive it. Or you just didn't really package it up and say it, you know, as, as eloquently as you probably should, or you sprayed and prayed, just kept talking and prayed. They heard something that they liked, you know, like, you know, like you really weren't prescriptive of what you were going to say. And so I just learned very early on, you know, to not accept no's. And if I, if I had a dollar for every no I've gotten in life and business, mostly in business, you know, I, I could have retired but I never heard it, never heard the no and converted many of those people to yeses. And literally last weekend, walking the dog down this the Commonwealth Mall here in Boston, I crossed paths with one of the venture capitalists that we met, you know, the beginning days of Constant Contact, who I think we got to like slide three and got kicked out of the office. Like this, no, this is not, you can't sell the small business. You don't have, you're like, you're going to need an army of salespeople and tons of money and you know, only Intuit and ADP, you know, can sell the small businesses. What, you know, who says you can? We were, gonna, we were the first SaaS offering ever, software as a service. You know, there were all these challenges and stuff we had to face as a business. But, you know, he kicked us out. And he's like, you know, you, you, were, the, you were that one that got away. I'm like, got away? You kicked us out. <laughs> he's like, no, that's not what happened. I said, probably on slide three, you told us that, you know, that you're not interested. So you can't sit there and tell us we got away. I said, you blew it. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I had a total laugh with them. Is that one of your successes is Constant Contact? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a founder, co-founder of Constant Contact. Yeah, that's one of them. That's the one everyone knows. Uh, it's uh, my household brand. Huge uh, one. They're, they're yeah. running a lot of commercials now, TV commercials. <clears throat> TV, radio, you'll see it at the bottom of your, in your inbox, you know, in every email. It's funny, the one with the plumber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, you walked right into one of my questions is I know people walk up to you all the time, right? Love to work for you. So I'm I'm gonna guess that it's really hard not to roll your eyes at everybody who's like, I'd love to work for you. What are the qualities that you look for in people you want to hire? Like everybody wants to work for you, but what are the qualities that you look for in someone other than the like? No yeah, so, yeah so I, like, I love the question because first and foremost, the number one thing, there's three, there's three things that I live by and, and it's, it's, or it's early in the culture of any of the companies I've started. You know, one is that we're title agnostic. And when you know, people come in and they want to see in their name, chief something, chief operating officer, chief revenue officer, chief, chief human resource officer, everyone wants chief. You know, and I'm like, we're title agnostic. There's no titles. We're all, you know, you're either a co-founder or you're on the founding team. All the early people, I put them on a founding team. Like, and you're going to be focused in operations or you're going to be in, in sales or you're going to be in development. And just, you know, titles don't matter, you know, and eventually someone will work their way into being that chief position or will bring someone in. But anyone who comes in is like, I need to have that title. You know, it's just, that's a, that's a big red flag for me. And even if they're really senior, it's like, look, we're all going to be, you know, you know, several of the companies I have one now we're replicating the same idea, but we have a box, you know, in the, in the, in the corner of an office and take the box apart and, and put your desk together. 
And when you're done with your desk, the next box is your computer. Put that together. When you need it wired up, call the, our IT guy and I'll come and do it. Like, wow. you know, it's like we all, you know, and by the way, you empty your own trash can. You know, there's a bin you can go throw it in. It's in the back. Like, you know, it, it just has to be that way. And, and so, so title agnostic, the understanding that people will, you know, will come in below you, next to you or above you. So you might be in charge of something, but just be ready. That's the, whatever's best for the business will might bring someone above you. And I, I hear it all the time. Well, I only want to work for you. I'm like, I might not be here <laughs> like, or I might not be in this role. Like I'm going to stay in my lane with what I'm good at. And I might do more things early on, but I'm going to peel off the stuff that there's better people at it than me. And I might not, you know, be in that role that you're going to, we're going to be interfacing day to day with, or that you would report to me. And the last is egos at the door, you know, like we can't, there's no room for, you know, folks that are just, you know, I, I see so many people that are like, yeah, I, I used to do that, you know, and it's like, especially in the startup phase, like you, you, you will get used to doing it again because we all got to, you know, we all got to, you know, kind of roll up our sleeves and do a lot of stuff. Maybe we did early in our career. So th those are important. And then in terms of the, you know, if someone comes in with that, that right sort of attitude and, you know, there, there would be a good culture fit. Then it's a question of how passionate are they about what we're doing? So I've had several companies that work with small businesses. And so I'd love to ask the question of someone I'm talking to, like, where do you shop? Like, you know, let's say this weekend you're going to, you know, a housewarming for someone who just bought a house. You're going to get him a gift. Like, where do you go? Like I go, I shop on Amazon. I'm an Amazon prime member. I buy on Amazon. I'm like, don't you go into your like local neighborhood, walk main street and shop. And like, no, I don't have time for that. Oh, so that person's going to, how well are they going to serve the small business customer base that we're <laughs> serving if they're not even, they don't even believe in them, right? So, so it, you know, it has to, there has to be a fit, you know, with regard to the, you know, who you're serving. And I think the last thing is, you know, aside from the things I mentioned is just, you know, staying in your lane. I know what I'm good at. Anything branding, go to market is my, is my strength. Have I run other parts of the company early on? Sure. But as fast as I could peel those off to someone like bringing in someone who can complement and, and run some of those other areas who's better at it, you know, you got to free it up to focus at what you're good at. The more that you do something that's outside your lane, you know, that there's an opportunity cost to do that because you have to learn that, you have to oversee it, you probably won't do it as well as someone else who's good at it. And so it's going to take you twice as much to do it versus the time if you spent it on what you're good at, you know, you, you can advance the business. Because, you know, you're, you're, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's second nature, you know, for what, for whatever's in your lane. So, you know, I didn't, I, I moved aside, you know, I was, you know, running companies and had CEO titles and gave them to someone who would be better at it. I don't care. Like, I don't care what my title is, whatever's best for the business. And a lot of people can't, can't stomach that. You know, they're like, no, I really need to be an executive and I need to be a considered a co-founder and I need to be you know, this, that, and the other. And I just want my title on a car to say E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> yeah, I love that. What a great answer. So I'll have, I'll ask one more question. I'll open it up to everybody else who's probably sitting on pins and needles trying to also ask questions. So what, how do you get to the last quarter of the year? What do you evaluate of what worked, what didn't, and how do you pre prepare for January? Yeah, so so my I act like every quarter is the last quarter. I don't wait. You know, I I try to evaluate quarter to quarter. What did we do? What did we do well that we can pour gas on? What didn't we do we well that we can do well that we can fix? And what's missing? You know, and I just I constantly do that on a regular basis. You know, and and it's it's really. You know, we get in the hamster wheel of our business and, I, and I'm just not a fan of waiting to the end of the year to step off because you're working in the business and, you're, you know, now you say, okay, let me step back and work on the business strategically. That, that's a process that has to happen all the time. Step away from the day to day, go away, you know, go on a retreat for a couple of days, clear your head, you know, and really think about, you know, what you're doing and, and you know, what are you, what are, what are you really good at? That you can pour the gas on what what is is not really going well or you 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 just haven't had time to do you know and 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 what what else can you be doing that's just going to advance this and you know I, I i don't see often see that 
you know, when I'm, when I'm heads down in the, in the day to day. So I really make time to think about the things strategically. And then the other thing that is really important that has to be done all the time is innovation time, thinking about how to advance and how to, you know, excel. And, you know, I've often found like the, the hidden gem in the business is just, a, just adjacent to what we're doing and just missed it, you know, or so testing, testing and investing in things to just see if there's a, a bigger opportunity that just, you know, has, has been missed. And so, so, you know, I think, you know, the, you know, the end of the year is, 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 is the moment to celebrate, you know, let's look back and see what we did really well. And then also be realistic with ourselves to say what, you know, did we, did we meet, were we below meet or exceed what we said we we're going to do? You know, and, and I, I, I do that through the year to make sure that when we get to the end of the year, it's not a wake up moment. Like, well, we kind of really missed the mark. You know, if you, if you get that far and you, and you're sitting there saying that, then you really should, you know, really have to think about doing it quarterly, you know, or monthly, even in some cases, you know, because, because, you know, we, you know, we, you know, if, if there's a pattern, if there's a, if there's a, if you see at the end that you haven't really achieved a lot, then there was a pattern that was formed that you're staying on, a, you're on a path and it may not be the happy path for the business. So you're on this and you're, and you're not going to sit there and say, hey, what are we going to do to change for next year? You know, you got to determine that you're not on that happy path as many times in the course of the year as possible and adjust. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. David Reed. I see. Yeah, I'm going to raise my hand. I always feel like Helen Thomas in the old White House press briefing. So I always have seem to have the first question of the mastermind. And I kind of. I love that, actually. I'm kind of going to take that. I'm always going to do the first question from now on, whether you want me to or not, Louisa. Um, but my question really is, and it's not specific to your business, or, but it's specific. I think it's more about a philosophy or about a discipline because, you know, we're all very busy people and we all have, you know, entrepreneurial aspirations and, and things that we want to do, but we also have lives and we also have priorities and things and, and, and a business that we may be doing nine to five. So, you know, I always, there's there, everybody has the same 24 hours in the day, but I want to know your thoughts. I mean, obviously you've done a bazillion things and you started very early and, and I, and build off one around the uh, one build, I'm sure off the other, but when you are trying to start say a business or you have an idea or a concept and I'm involved in a couple. And at the same time, you are, you know, living your life and, still have to pay your bills and still have to run, you know, your nine to five job, which for me sometimes is, you know, nine to nine and nine to nine to eight the next day, 23 hours in the day. How did you find, or how did you, you know, what was the belief you had that gave you all the time in the world? Or how did you allocate your time to figure out to do the things that you wanted to do that made you the most successful? Does that the question make sense? It does. Yeah. So I think, there's a couple of ways that that set this up and framing it. So one is you you have a you know you, we all you know we all have a life so that that's a constant you know where there's there's stuff outside of, of business. A lot of cases someone has a job you know mm-hmm. and so they have to work on the foot in your which you describe and then they're trying to see about I have an idea and I want to you know see if I if this has legs and I want to you know kind of explore it. And in other instances, people have been displaced. You know, and some have the luxury of a of a you know a package where they they're getting paid for some period of time or or unemployment or whatever the things that may help them a little bit, but they you know they have they have this this idea and a conviction to kind of bring it forward. I, I think in any of those instances that it's it's a quality versus quantity in terms of time. You know, like you don't need a lot of time if you have an idea. I mean, I have, I, I don't have them right here in front of me, but I actually have the napkins, you know, the, the cocktail napkins that I've written. And this doesn't mean in a bar, but, you know, the small napkins mm-hmm. for you know, <laughs> writing, writing my Nothing ideas. wrong with a bar. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I've, I've advanced to small pieces of paper, you know, with, you know, a million ideas and, and other things. But so, so I'm constantly noodling on things, but I think the biggest thing, you know, Again, another one of these, if I had a dollar for everyone who asked me, you know, do, what do you think of my idea? I'm like, 
doesn't matter what I think, what your target market think. So really getting, getting into what the bullseye of the dartboard of who's your target market and then bringing it to that target market. And if they can answer two questions, one, this is really valuable. And I, you know, I could see this helping my business to either increase revenue, decrease expense or other, other potential value there. And two, is this something you're willing to pay for? And they say, it's priceless. Of course I would. You're onto something. And now the question is, how do you formalize that to go forward? And so, so for me, it didn't take much for me to noodle on an idea and then just go find who the target market was and go out, talk to. And so, you know, don't, if you go to family and friends like me, they're, oh, we love you. You're, you know, it's going to be so successful. You know, what a great idea. And don't go to people you've done business with before because it's a bias. You go to strangers, you'll get brutal, honest feedback. So I would just go seek out someone I didn't know who doesn't know me and or anything about, about my background to just ask, you know, their thoughts about, you know, and you lead, you lead them by asking questions of them first. You know, the key thing in talking to anyone about your, your idea and bringing it forward is to listen. If you take the word listen and you move the letters around, it spells silent. So be silent and present and listen to somebody as they're presenting to you, you know, the basically the kind of the roadmap of what's important to them and what where their pain points are. are and then you could play back. If I could, in fact, you know, drive additional revenue and keep you top of mind with your current customers and bring you new customers, would that be a value to like you could turn the, this this whole thing into you know, answering kind of their pain points with, you know, with, with whatever it is that you're bringing forward. And then just say, I, I just would love your feedback, you know, on, on what we're doing to see if this, you know, again, is something they see is valuable and two, they're willing to pay for. And so, you know, that, that's the driver for me to be like, okay, this needs, I need to put some, some time and effort on this. And I'd go noodle on it with other people, um, you know, and, and see what they they think, and and others like you know I've been thinking about something similar. I'd love to work with you on it, and you know, and and I now I'm very fortunate to have a group of folks that I you know that my ride alongs for any time I have an idea. I've got my contract CMO, part time CMO. I've got people to run stuff by in different area development and so on. But starting out, I didn't have any of it. But I would talk to people, and I knew people that it's like you got to surround yourself with, you know, at least one or two other folks that can work in areas and in a different lane that that you're in. If you're a business development and sales, and you have three of you, you know, that are strong in that, what's that going to do for you? You know, and and don't don't ever say that. Well, we're all we're all co-founders, and we're all co-CEOs. I I just talked to somebody on on Saturday met the three founders and they're all co-CEOs. I'm like, well, what's your, what's your area of focus? And it was clear someone had the, you know, the CEO role, someone was going to be sales and business development and someone is going to be operations. And, and I said, at the end of the day, who's the one person that's going to be the CEO when you get funded? And they, and they hemmed and hawed and we couldn't answer it. And I'm like, this is going to fail. Like if you can't sit here and, and tell me what lane you're in, and, and know that only one of you will lead this company when you get funding. They may accept two CEOs if, they're, if, they've, if you have a track record. And so I think, you know, we, we often just, we, we set up the barriers and, and the points of failure. But it's just get out to the target market. You know, once you, you know, that, that's all I needed. So when I heard all the no's, you know, it's like my target market says they need it. If you're not willing to fund it, I'll find someone else who will. Like, or if you're not willing to come in and mentor me, you know, like, you know, seeking out within two, two degrees of separation, all the people you need to access are there waiting for you. Awesome. I don't know if that, that was a roundabout way to answer your question. No, it was great. It was great. I, I just find, you know, like, you know, people, there's some people who know, know me. I mean, I, my job. If I wanted to on my nine to five job, I could never stop. You know, I would, I, I could, you know what I mean? Just to keep up. And at the same time, that's not what I'm, that's not what's going to define me or what I'm going to do the rest of my life. So I'm finding that balance of doing the, you know, that and also work on the entrepreneurial things, the things that I know are going to break and succeed and will provide wonderful things for this world. I just need to be able to do it. And at the same time, like I said, work my nine to five job that doesn't eventually, you know, kill me at the end of the day. Sure. So just two, just the two quick points that I would say yeah. on that specifically. 
So my first job out of college, I mentioned, you know, I stayed there for nine years and had a great, mm -hmm. you know, great sales career. And the second in command up in sales and in, in, in worldwide international sales, sales was leaving to go to a startup. And he said, hey, I want you to come. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, well, I don't know if in six months if we can pay you or if we're going to be around. But if we can crack this thing, you know, then, you know, it, it uh, would, you know, could be successful. Now, there's this opportunity that I may not be around and uh, they may not be able to pay me. And I had $4 million of potential bookings that I was going to get commissioned on a lot of money. And I'm sitting there, $4 million or six months, I'm out of a job, <laughs> you know, out of the startup's going to blow up. And I was like, what do I do? So I, I said, you know, I'm going to just I really think about it. So I stayed three months, closed half that business. And then I left and went to the startup and took, took the chance that in six months, I could be out of a job. And five years to the day, we went public. And, and, and two years later, we sold. And so this wasn't Constant Contact. It was the, another one called VMark. And it was an unknown software company that, you know, we just had great success with. But, you know, I was willing to take the chance and I had control over North American sales, sales and marketing and had control over our destiny. You know, like if we, we make sales and we, we're getting funded, we'll keep getting funded, we'll grow this thing. And of course, I didn't really fathom what that was. I had this options and I had this piece of paper, never put it in the drawer and just, just put my head down. And, you know, when we went public, I'm like, this piece of paper is worth what? <laughs> like it just didn't, it didn't click. You know, I really honestly just was like, and so I am living in, you know, the, you know, the home that I bought when we went public, you know? And so, you know, it was like, wow, how do I do this again? You know? And so starting over from scratch with a, you know, idea on a napkin and, and just building up businesses. So I've either that particular one, I was employee number 12 or something. So I wasn't a, you know, original co-founder, but we hadn't even sold a single thing. So I was on the founding team and they called me a co-founder, but I was really on the founding team. And then the other quick story was that, you know, when we started, you know, so years later, after several successes, we, you know, started Constant Contact and we agreed we were not going to be salaried for two years. I had three mortgages, cars, I had everything. And I was not going to take a salary for two years. So I was bleeding out money. And I'm like, you know, I, you know, you know, had a conviction. And once we went out in the target market, told us we had what, you know, what, what they needed. Um, but we didn't know how we we're going to get it to market and scale it, you know, and got all the things that the objections that we were presented with, we were, were not sure how we we're going to answer them. But we, you know, we certainly figured it out. But my mom, every single day called me, was like, you know, you're going to go bankrupt. You know, how could you do this? You work so hard. And now you're doing this startup thing again. And, you know, <laughs> and, and so 10 years later to the day we went public and who in, on Facebook in all caps wrote, I always knew it would be a success. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mom. So that, that was mom for you. Thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah. By the Thank way, the you. second time I've heard that story where somebody's mom says, there's no way this is crazy. And then at the end, when it's successful, I, knew it. I always told him to do this. <laughs> That's my son. I always knew it would be success. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's oh, not I one thing. It's a mother. <laughs> so there you go. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so. Thank Philip. you. Sure. Philip, I'd love your question. Hey, Philip. So I have a couple, but I'm just going to go with one and then I'll go back in line. But you were the first person that I ever met at the Secret Knock event and that I had a conversation with. And I had only known about it for about three days prior. And I was super nervous. And after I met you, everything was, oh, this is cool. I got this. Then at the Humanitarian Awards, they asked me to put together a team and bring the team down. So I, got a bunch of people that I knew would succeed very well. They came down. You were also the first person that my crew met. And each one of them was super impacted by you. And they, when they talk about who did they meet, they're like, oh, Sir Alex Stern, you know? Uh -huh. And yeah, not Alex Stern, but Sir Alex Stern. Thank Congratulations. You. And they, what is your ability, or is this something you do consciously, or is it your personality to find when someone's uncomfortable 
and you can help with the flow of the energy around that person to kind of what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I love the question. I appreciate the, the kind words. Yeah, so for, for, for years, just, you know, I would go to conferences or, or I would hear someone speak or I'd meet someone and, and I'd want to like say something to them and they would, I get, you know, their handlers would block me from like talking to them or, you know, I'd say like, I would just, just wanted to thank, thank them for, you know, the talk and they'd get whisked away and, you know, go off in their limos and, and whatever. And so I just said, if I'm ever asked to keynote an event or speak or receive an award or whatever it is that, that I'm going to be the first one at the event, the last one to leave, and I'm going to be present and, and available. If I ever get that opportunity, of course, you know, having spoken to in the last 18 months, a million people, you know, I mean, I'm just going to have gone around the world and, and we'll do that again soon. But, you know, the, the, the thing for me is to, like, I, I don't let, like, I just have, I put myself in the shoes of the people that I'm around and I don't let anything affect me. You know, somebody asked me the other day, like, how, you know, do you have your own plane? I'm like, no, I'm America's guest when it comes to planes and boats. I have friends that have them. I will never own a plane or a boat. You know, like I'll just borrow friends. But I'm like, no, I fly coach, maybe extra leg room if I'm feeling, you know, super, you know, super special. But I'm not, I'm not one to like, I don't, I don't, it's, it's just not my, in my nature to be anything other than myself. And so people, you know, will often just say that, you know, just you're so down to earth and, and whatever. And, and so, so. Most of the time, I don't know, like, I don't, no one knows me. I don't know them. And I'm just being myself. And, and in other instances, maybe they know who I am or I've, I know who they are through association or whatever, but none of, it, none of it really matters. You know, I don't, I'm not like, I'm, I'll put myself on the same level as anyone else. I'm the first one to chat up the, the bus boy at the restaurant or, you know, hear the story of the bus boy who's trying to make it and talk to the restaurant owner. And, you know, two months later, that person is now a waiter, you know, or like, you know, work, you know, talk to them, coach them, whatever. I like for me, you know, everyone, everyone, you know, we're all climbing up uphill, you know, and anyone who can help push, push someone up the hill. I guess I'm one of those people. So I'm paying it forward, you know, because I never had the opportunity early on, you know, to, to get to some of those people or I, it took a lot to get to them, but I was, I was persistent. I mean, that's one thing. I know some people are in a book series, but my the Think and Grow Rich principle of persistence was is my chapter <laughs> in, a, in a as a celebrity author in this book series, Thirteen Steps to Riches, or something like yes. that. I'm one of the authors on it, and are they are yeah? Yes. So some of the others are in that, but that's you know that I and Eric, you know, so the the guy who was running it, Eric ask me what give me three chapters that you'd be interested in i'm like persistence 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 <laughs> so so that's what i got <laughs> but uh, yeah so it's so you know i just i don't know i just that's just always been my nature and i and you know i didn't i had as you know we were provided for growing up i didn't know what you know i have a lot of friends that were living in mansions wall street you know i live i grew up outside of new york so I was in Connecticut in the New Jersey and, and a lot of Wall Street were my neighbors and with all the fancy cars and kids driving, you know, Ferraris in high school. And, you know, we, we were provi provided for and comfortable, but, you know, we were li living beyond our means. And it was always a challenge to get to go on a vacation. My father would be like, we don't have the money. And my, they'd fight it over. Of course, my mother won every fight and we'd be on vacation. <laughs> We'd go on those vacations, but he, you know, he would, he was just, he had his association with money, you know, was a, was challenging you know so i just never never I, I never changed you know when i started coming into some money and and never will you know it just it's just, i guess it's just, it's just in my nature so thank you yeah thanks so rinda i love the little mini hands <laughs> okay i wrote this down so i'm trying to i wrote it down real quick while you were talking but you were so when it comes to like employees or even investing into a company, would you rather invest in someone who knows everything but doesn't work as hard or somebody who will work hard and find a solution and is always willing to learn? Yeah, I love it. Part E. 
I so I, you know I I've invested in in people and in, in companies where you know I felt that that as I mentioned earlier like if there's a problem or or, or if they hit a wall there's an obstacle they're going to figure they're going to stop and figure it out you know they don't have all the answers but they're going to figure it out I would take that all day long versus someone who's got the blinders on and tell you like I I was that tar- I was the target market I know what they need you know and I mean they're going down with the Titanic because you know this stuff changes every day and if they're not willing to go out and talk and listen to the target market even though they're an expert in it you know you know I I mean, I was a top 100 influencer in digital marketing and, and, you know, for, you know, and, and a top speaker in the space. And, but, but I still will go and listen to somebody, you know, and, and take feedback and not sit there and, and, to, and defer to others on it today because I, I just don't want to do that anymore. So I'll just defer to others. But I would always, you know, someone who's, who's willing to, to do whatever it takes and figure it out and learn. Is, is more valuable because the other ones will, if it doesn't go their way, you know, they're going to, they're going to take the bat and ball and go home. And I've seen so many who, you know, it failed for the wrong reasons, like an obstacle hit that was too big for them. And it weighed on them more and more and more, and they never solved it. And they, and they, they, they went home. And so, yeah, I have the, something to be said for, you know, for those that are tenacious and, you know, and, and, and so I think there's a fine line with the passion meter. You know, if you had like the passion meter of like, well, yeah, it goes this way. Sorry. This way. Yeah. So you don't want it pinned. Like someone is so crazy over the top passionate that they're, they're just not going to really see, see the, the obstacles and the issues at hand. But you want enough passion that they're going to do whatever it takes, you know, to figure it out. So so I applaud anyone who's who's gotten it out and figuring it out and and you know that are willing to talk to others to to figure out the breakthrough. I mean, I've literally had some people say to me like, "But you don't you don't know the target market like I do." I'm like, "I don't need to know your target market. <laughs> like, I need you to tell me that you're talking to your target market that you don't know more than they know." You know, I mean, they get in these arguments and they're like, no, I, I, I've been in that. Sp- I've been the target market for, for 10, 15, 20 years. Like, I know what they need. That's why I started this business. I'm like, but, the, you know, but that's dated as of yesterday. So, you know, and it just, yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a real pet peeve for me, but I do appreciate it. that's a great question because it's, it does really center on someone's, you know, someone's passion, you know, where they're on the passion meter, but also, you know, the, to gut it out you know, and be able to, you know, handle the obstacles at hand. And I do want to say one thing on that. We all, we're all going to face obstacles, right? And so, you know, just declare it. You're not the first one, the last one to ever experience that obstacle. Many people have experienced it before you. And some have failed at knocking it down. Some have succeeded at knocking it down. And you've got to seek counsel, you know, like, be, you know, like I, I've had to declare to, to folks, you know, this at this stage in my career that we got a problem and I don't know how to, like, I'm not sure the best way to address it and go to people and like, come on, you know, you've been there before. I'm like, you know, I just look, you, we all got to seek that guidance and, and that counsel and, and figure out a way to knock it down. And it might be breaking it up into small wins, small pieces and have small wins to chip away at it. Or learn from those that have failed, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to do a certain way, like I try that and it didn't work. Like, you know, there's so many people around you that, that can assist in getting you to knock those down because you've got to create the muscle memory to knock down the obstacles because I guarantee you the one sitting behind the one you're knocking down is bigger. And when you knock that one down, the one behind that one's bigger. And as you advance, you know, you plateau and freeze. If you don't knock down that obstacle, you're not going to the next tier and up and up to you know, to scale whatever your idea is, you know, the obstacles, you know, like, I mean, I've had some ones like, what do you mean we can't make payroll next week? Like, you know, things like, you know, we got miles to feed, employees with miles to feed, families, like we can't make payroll. Are you kidding me? You know, and then I find a way, like I humor, I find humor in everything, unfortunately, for some, <laughs> but I find humor in every situation. So it gets the endorphins going and then, and then, you know, we figure out how to solve it. Like, I'm like, you know, I, you know, and I can never have an Amex card. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I, uh, 
overspent my way to, to solve some early problems in some businesses. <laughs> <laughs> I did pay, didn't pay on their schedule as they would have liked. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm banned from Amex except for a corporate card. <laughs> so. That's well, you know, I remember when I was at Secret Knock, this couple came in and the very first thing I heard out of the husband's mouth was, how is this going to equal money? Tell me how I'm not wasting my time again. And I literally wanted to crawl underneath the chair and hide because I was so embarrassed that somebody would actually say that. Like we we're a group of, in my world was like contribute, care about, give and then ask, like, well, how can I give so then I can even have what I'm even looking for versus walking in the door and being like, how does this equal money for me? So I love that earlier you said when you go to someone, ask them how you can contribute to them before you request anything. And that is so huge because I think that's what's missing in the world is people are like, what can you give me versus how can we well, how can I give you? How can we co-collaborate? How can we create together? And they do walk around with, I'm only going to do this when I see money in it for me. And I find that to be hard for me. No, it's a great point. And I think the, you know, the, I mean, some of it, some, some of, in order for you to break through in a conversation with someone, you know, you know, you have to show that you care about what, what they're all about. Like people reach out to me. I mean, I get a thousand emails a day and people reach out and they'll, they're like, Hey, read the attached slide deck and let me know if you, you know, if you're interested in, in a conversation, I'm like, delete, like, sorry, I don't <laughs> care who it is or what it is. Like if someone's actually taking the time to say, Hey, you know, I said, you know, I, just looking at your background, talking to some folks that know you, I think there's a great fit in something that I'm working on that that ties into your background, and, and it would be nice to be better synergistic. Here's what I'm doing, and and here's where I see you fitting in. And they put a little time and effort into it. And can I just get 15 minutes with you? I've attached a little bit of additional information. If someone goes to that level, I'm going to read it. I'm going to look what they attach, and I'm going to most likely have that conversation. Or if it's not a fit for me, I'm going to find someone who it is and say, look. This is great. It's not really in my wheelhouse, but I do have someone that I think it might be. And I'll ask them, would you be open to talking to this, you know, forward it on, you know, and, and, and so, so I've done a lot of that, but, but, you know, you've got to put a little bit of effort in, in a conversation or in a, in an email communication or, or even, even if it's just a quick, you know, thank you for your talk, you know, say, I loved when you said X or Y, or not just a quick thank you. Like it's nice. It's nice. It feels it's nice, but but it just it, it just brings it to another level if you say, OK, when you it re- resonated with with me when you said X, Absolutely. you know, I mean, like it's, I, not, it's not hard to do. Right. It goes back to actually I have a, what had you say yes to me to showing up to tonight? Because I, I get how everybody wants your time. Everybody wants you to contribute. And I am so beyond grateful you were here. So what had you say yes to me to being here? Well, you followed me for an hour. No, <laughs> that's our no, little. Just, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. It was more like two hours. No, so so because you led with value, like you, we had a conversation, and you said, you know, uh, you you complimented me for receiving the humanitarian award, the, and and you you know you shared some things, like you know, I've I've heard you speak, and what resonated with you on some stuff that I had spoken to that stuff I spoke about that resonated with you and, and you were just, you know, you were very gracious to, to give me some of that feedback and that, that, and then you see, you know, I have a mastermind and, you know, of like-minded folks and I would, you know, would you ever consider speak, speaking at it? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So, I mean, it was easy because, you know, we had a conversation and, and you weren't just, you'd, I mean, people, I get these all the time. Like, you know, I have a mastermind. Would you be willing to speak at it? I'm like, you know, I don't, you know, you shared about your mastermind and the people that are on it. And, you know, you shared, you know, shared things that at least gave me context. If there's no context, like, you know, it's, it's just, it falls on deaf ears. You, you put, put a little bit of the effort in up front that then it was easier for me to, to want to just say yes in two seconds. 
I appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, it's just such a huge contribution to all of us because for so many reasons, and it gives such possibility to it's the fact that like one of what you said today is it wasn't handed to you. There was a lot of work that went into it and you were willing to be there and work through it. And, and the, the beingness behind that, I just find that to be so admirable. No, thanks. Yeah. Listen, I'm, you know, I, uh, I always talk about how, you know, uh, staying in your lane, but also like uh, looking for new pockets of opportunity and, and, and when starting something new, it's starting fresh. Like everyone's like, Oh, it's so easy for you because you've done it before. You could just pick up the phone and call anyone. I'm like, I can, but I don't like, I'd rather talk to someone I don't know who doesn't know me and get their honest feedback. Like, you know, two of these two new ideas. We went, I said, we're going to find people that, you know, that don't know anything about us. You know, and I traveled into, I was in a couple of places that, you know, just sort of second tier cities and just went out talking to small businesses. Like they're not going to know who I am, you know, and then that we'd share some information. I tell them what I'm working on. And, you know, with a couple of new ideas that, of software apps that we're launching and getting their honest feedback. You know, and then we get in the conversation we're like, well, what have you done in the, you know, what else have you done? You know, I'll mention it like we use constant contact or we, you know, you know, they, they're familiar with just some of the different products, but, or, or we're cut our customers or we're customers. So, so that's always fun, but I don't lead with, like, I don't lead with that. I have a lot of friends that want to tell people all they've done. Here's, here's another thing I've done, by the way. And here's another thing, you know, and I'm like, it's just, I, I want to know, if, like, just can I present this thing and, and someone convince somebody that this is this is real and great without any bias to it, you know? Right. So that's why whenever, like, I love to talk to people before, like, I go to a conference and just walk up to people. Hi, like, what brought you here? And and then, like, well, what brought you here? I said, well, I'm just, you know, helping out, you know, or like, I won't really say much. And I just, you know, I just, because, you know, it's, you know, there, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any leveling or, you know, class distinctions because someone's a successful entrepreneur and someone's a new entrepreneur or whatever. We're, equal, we're all equals. We're all entrepreneurs, you know, and I've been in, in the shoes of, you know, many, many times I'm there again, you know, starting, starting new things. So, and, you know, you got to gut it out. No, oh, you know, one of the things that I, when I see you, I just want to call you Sir Alex Stern. And it's so funny to like actually walk into those shoes. It it just seems so natural. How did that happen? Yeah. So, and if you don't, I can have you arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pretend I don't like that. <laughs> There's lots of reasons she should be arrested. That's <laughs> Put it on the list. Put it on the list. Yeah. So, so, I mean, the way uh, there's 26 monarchs in the world and, and monarchies and 23 of them have a civilian category. The others are it's uh, military and the royal family and then the third category civilian. So 23 out of 26 out of the civilian category. Everyone knows, uh, you know, England, you know, you know, Sir Elton John and Sir Paul, Paul McCartney and Sir Richard Branson. The original monarch back to 315 AD is Spain. And Spain into Turkey is the original, and everything spawned out of that. And so the only way you you get nominated for a knighting, so a sir for men or a dame or lady for women, is an existing sir or dame or lady nominates you. And in the case of Spain, they have they had twenty five hundred nominations, and they chose twenty four people. So it's well, typically twelve women, twelve men, and. I got a call, you know, that I've been nominated and 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 that and chosen. And I thought it was friend goofing on me. <laughs> you know, like I'm like, oh yeah, what's what's you know, here's another, you know, my jokester friends. I just was like, what? And so, you know, I was just, you know, kind of blown away. And then, you know, sort of just it was moved, it was fast. You know, we the Prince of Raphael from Spain came to the Venetian and, and they did it in the Venetian hotel in uh, Vegas with a huge, very moving ceremony. And, you know, and uh, like, I mean, I, I was, you know, reduced to tears just bef even before getting knighted because it was just so moving. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, once I done, did some research to, to understand, you know, the, you know, the, 
you know, the Royal Order and kind of what all that, 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 they're, that they're made of. And, you know, there's a lot of people that like, you know, that I was knighted with and a lot before me that, you know, are, were certainly, I mean, it's some are no Nobel Peace Prize worthy, you know, it's, so it was, I was touched and honored, still sort of questioning why me, but, but hey, I'll take it. <laughs> well, everyone why, here knows why you. I think everybody here, <laughs> now that you know everybody here. I think the goal would be to be so successful and so worthy that Sir Alex Stern would be the one that would nominate anybody else in here down the road. There it is. That you'd be the one to do it. That's right. I'm waiting, waiting for seeing what you are going to do. And exactly. <laughs> That's right. And uh, sorry, I just I don't know if you could hear the dog behind me trying to get my attention. <laughs> I did that all the time. I'm actually. Does the does the do, does the dog have a title? I'm just curious because I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny you ask. So so I re I don't know the term rehomed him. I guess so I was I was waiting to to I, he's a Tibetan terrier and I had one prior and I was waiting to get one and I wanted this this brindle tricolor which is very rare more rare than black and white or blue gray and one happened to be in a litter and. I missed the boat on that litter, but an older couple took the took them for four months, and then they felt that they were he they were too frail to do what you know take all the time taking them to the parks and socializing them and walking them and whatever. And so they the rule with this this particular breeder is you know the dog comes back to the breeder at any age, you know they don't want it, just anyone adopting. So they brought him back, and she called me and she said, "I think I have a perfect scenario for you. It's he's a male, he's the colors you want, you know, every, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera." And I went down on a Friday. Sorry, no. She called me on a Friday. I went on Sunday, and then I picked him up Tuesday. Like it was a like I'll take him. She's like, "You're not taking him. We're going to groom him for you before you take him." So I picked him up on a Tuesday. But his official name is Gentleman Bo, (laughs) and and I kept the name because you know they chose the name, and I love the name. So I was I, I you know I mean they're like you know you can change the name. You're still young enough. I'm like. You know, I can't think of a better name, you know, once I met him. So, nice. but, yeah, so he's a gentleman. So good. <laughs> so, so good. Joe, would you like to say anything? Absolutely. One of, <laughs> one of the comments you made about passion or dealing with passionate people is that they have to have a a, not a barrier, but they have to have a control factor that their passion keeps them from a, a, a sense of success because they're always looking for this perfection of their passion. How, how do you deal with some, because I'm involved with somebody like that. It's, it's, it's a way, a way to show them that, you know, you know, perfect is the enemy of good, which is for, for everybody, you know, yeah. serves everybody. Yeah. So I'm a recovering perfectionist. Oh, so, yeah. You have a sense of humor about it. See? No, no. I mean, I was always like, you know, but, but I mean, these are all like, I could sit here today with all these, like, this is what you got to do. And this is how you do it. Like I had to learn a lot of this myself. So one of the things I was always, you know, I'm a, you know, just attention to detail and, and is really is always been one of my things, but I had to learn it, it's good enough. And that was really hard. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Really how, do you, how do you assist somebody to reach that level? So, so, so what I, what I learned about it, like if you're, if you're a perfectionist and working on something, you're obviously, you're probably not seeking counsel with it. Right. So you're like, I know, and I'm just going to keep going and this is what it needs to be. And I had to learn that I, it's not what I think, it's what the target market thinks. So I would stop and, you know, it's good enough, bring it to the target market and then, and then decide is, is you know, it, the trade-off. If, if I seek perfection on something and it's going to take me six to nine months more versus bringing something out and seeking counsel and feedback from the target market, would, would I end up with the exact same thing in six to nine months? No, not at all. They're going to tell me what we really need and what's more important to them, which it would be probably much different than what I think it should be. 
So I learned, this is a learned trait to just stop. It's good enough. You know, like that became a joke, you know, on like, like whatever it was, like we need, when we first started Constant Contact, we needed a logo. I went to a friend, we were getting on a plane to go to our first event to, to present you know, the company. We didn't have business cards. We didn't have a logo. We didn't have anything. So I went to a friend who's a photographer, but had a studio and he could do some design stuff. I'm like, we literally stopped at his office on our way to the airport. And I was like, okay, we need a, we need a logo and we need, we need colors and we need to like, just lay out a card and we'll print it when we get there at Kinko's or whatever, or FedEx or whatever it was at the time. And so um, like, we're working on this thing and he's doing a fade and whatever. I'm like, it's good enough. Like, we got to just, this is good. We're taking it. We're done. We'll change it later. <laughs> you know, and it just, it just was, you know, that's just a small example of just, you know, honestly, like stopping, you know, getting out of our own way. I have, I have a friend who is a perfectionist who's working on an idea six years later. He's still in, they're still in development. And I said to him a year, year one was long enough that bring it to market because so you have an idea and it's, and it's brand new and doesn't exist. And now there's a bunch of competitors in the space that have bypassed them and they're still in development, trying to outpace the competitors who are already out there with customers, revenue, finance, you know, getting you know, investment and, you know, and financing and so on. So, you know, I just, I, it's a learned trait, but I just, I say to anyone who who's working in a vacuum, trying to seek the perfection, to, to stop. It's good enough to get it out in, in, in the hands, you know, early access, get it in the hands of some customers and then, and then iterate around what they're telling you you need to do next. And it will not look like what that perfectionist wants it to be. Ever. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. And time to market, time to market, you know, like, you no. know, if you, if you sit around and you, and you keep trying to, a noodle on it and tweak it to make it better, you're, you're going to get bypassed. You know, simple as that. Well, I appreciate that feedback and it gives me some keywords to be able to discuss, even discuss with this individual the prospect of perfection or getting it to market and having the target market appreciated or rejected. Yeah, or they'll give you the feedback of what's what's missing and what else is needed. And, right. And I'll bet that I'll bet they're not out there talking to the target market. He, he knows it. No, he or she knows it well enough. Knows what they need. I'm going to keep working on it. I have I have it in my head what we we need to be doing. You know, and that's that that you know that's a setup for failure. And I just had to learn that. You know, yeah, but I, I need this other guy to learn it. You've already learned it. <laughs> so no, Joe, you need to teach him. Teach him. You can away. do that. Yeah. Need you need to him. enroll him, Joe. No, you can't teach. You can't. You never can tell another person what to no, do. No, you can enroll. You can help him no, learn just and discover. Miss, missed opportunity, you yeah. know, or or get bypassed by competitors or, you know, like, you know, everything moves so quickly. You know, yeah. he doesn't have time to stay to stay in in a, in a bubble. And, and, and keep developing it. So true. I want to be very conscious of your time. I know we've been on I'm for a good. while. How yeah. can we contribute to you? No, I appreciate maybe, that. Uh, maybe you need a couple of ideas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I don't need. <laughs> I'm always willing, willing to listen. He's got lots of ideas. He doesn't get a lot of good ideas. So, so honestly, so... I call it the bicycle wheel syndrome, but whenever I get into a, I have an idea and a target market, by the time, you know, we noodle on it, like every spoke, spoke on a wheel is another sub idea or an idea that, that we've come up with for that target market. And then it's back to the, the age old, what's the one spoke you're going to focus on? There's only, you got to focus on one thing, have success with it, get the, get, get the feedback, get testimonials, you start to get some revenue, you get the flywheel of the business going, and you could always grab another spoke, you know, and ones that are adjacent to it go next, and then you work on other ones, you know, from there. And it's so important to, to focus and really figure out that, you know, the, you know the, the bullseye on the dartboard. And so that's another hard thing, for, you know, for when we're sitting here and wanting to solve all the world's problems for a target market, 
we come up with all these ideas and none of them are bad ideas. Just put them on the shelf for now and pick the one that you're going to start with. And, you know, and the others can come into play later. I mean, look at Nike's a great example, right? They started with sneakers, basketball sneakers. Then they went into all different tennis and, you know, other, other sneaker with running and so on. Then they deviated over to things like cleats, you know, for soccer and for, you know, and golf shoes and right. A little bit of a deviation, but then they moved into totally different industry for golf balls, bags, you know, clubs, you know, clothing, et cetera. And so every time you do that, if it's not adjacent, like a basketball shoe to a running shoe is somewhat adjacent, you know, in this analogy, but you move over to the golf bags, balls, that's starting a whole new business that requires a whole nother set of, you know, resources and money and, you know, and development and all kinds of stuff. So, so at the end of the day, you got to pick that one, what's the one core thing you're going to, you're going to focus on first. And that, that's, that in itself is a struggle for many because they're like, I have so many things that that are, they're all great ideas, but you know, in the case of constant contact, we had every spoke on the wheel, which ended up becoming all kinds of other companies with all these things we're going to do to help small businesses. And we decided we're going to email marketing was going to be the first thing. And then there was no software as a service. We had to deliver it on a CD when we started. This is dating myself here. And then, and then when, when SaaS, the concept of SaaS became a reality, we were one of the first two SaaS offerings ever. Right. And that's just so, so then we had our, we had the ability to build once and sell many or rent many. And then, you know, we're off to the races but, you know, it was a struggle, but we still got people to take the product with an installed CD into their computer. And, and we got some partners that would, you know, install it on there, you know, to, to, to market it out to others. There, you know, there were a lot of learnings in that. There were a lot of people that would not, at the time, wouldn't buy us an online software. They wanted it to go to Staples and buy it in a box. So we put a CD in a box with a little manual that when you plugged it in, it connected you to the online software, (laughs) you know, but it was like, you know, the the perception around, you know, so every uphill battle you can imagine, you know, we, we, we faced, uh, you know, from that, you know, from that, that, that example. And, and each, every time I've done a startup, there's been more of these major hurdles, you know, and that you just work, you know, you sort of work through and, you know, and, uh, you know, just, you know, know that, that there, these obstacles are going to hit, you got to find a solution. And, and some of these were big, you know, software as a service is now a household or a cloud can it was application service pro- provider, ASP became SaaS, became cloud, and it'll be something else in a few years. Like, you know, all that didn't exist, you know? And so talk about a, talk, talk, talk about a major scale strategy hurdle, <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we build it and get it to many people? You know, that was especially to small businesses, which is very hard to sell, you know, to main street small businesses around the world. So nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) It's really remarkable what, you know, getting to the part where it's an expectation, not a surprise to hit hurdles. You know, I've been doing hair for 25 years and I've been standing behind people at the salon and, and they go through things. And some of the things early on would make me sit in the corner and rock back and forth of like what they experienced. And they would just expect that this is what was happening. And it really like created this new space for me of going, wow, they're not rattled by it. And at some point it really, I I see how that was part of the process. And now instead of being traumatized and thinking, I'm going to go sit in the corner and rock back and forth, I go, wow, I'm not rattled by as much anymore. And each and every step has created it as an opportunity to go, all right, how can we work through this? And looking back a year ago on something that would normally scare me, I don't even remember what happened on this day a year ago. So I now go, am I going to remember this a year from now? Right. Oh, yeah. No, it's just, I mean, if you're like me, when I, I used to take a piece of paper and on the first line, put the obstacle and put a little box next to it. 
and I'd hope, you know, I'd check the box by the end of the day and it, I wouldn't, it was there the next day and the next day and it would weigh on me. And yeah, I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I, I somehow avoided it. Oh, I got so busy with all these other things. And, you know, those are all excuses to not ta- tackle it. Now when an obstacle comes, it's, I'm like, bring it, you know, we got this, like, you know, find a way to laugh at it and then, you know, seek the counsel and, you know, and break it into smaller pieces, nail, you know, get some wins out of it and knock it down. And, you know, it's a, it create that muscle memory. You know, I didn't have all these things. It's so great to say it now, but I didn't have them when I stood, you know, I, I had all the, I was set up for failure with all the stuff in my head, <laughs> you know, and for a lot of it, and then just had to learn, you know, the, you know, how to, how to address these things. And, 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 I think the biggest thing is people are hesitant. You know, we're all sitting here hesitant. If I ask in the, you know, how many of you have that strategic person you want to call to either be your mentor, a strategic partner, a, a customer, an investor, you know, an employee, you know, that, and you're hesitant to call them because we're just not ready to, to, you know, call them. You know, the idea is not baked enough or we got to do more on the website or we got to finish off something with the, with the offering. Like we all have those excuses and so we're hesitant. And so you got to break the hesitance you know, and get out there and make that call and talk to those people. And if it's a strategic partner, it's nothing's, lin- it's all linear with them. So if you don't call them today and you wait six months to be more ready, then you're starting the process with them. It's going to take nine months to a year. So you've just lost those first six months. You could be talking to them now long before you're going to have to impress them with some detailed thing that you're working on. That's going to take six months and you've already chipped away six months in the relationship, you know, cycle you know with those with those people and even with investors you know showing them showing them a basic demo before the you know it's got to be a while before you're going to get real deep you know as you're working through all the stuff that you know that they want to hear about and what and same with mentors and you know people are a little bit lenient to say look you know this is our this is where we are on our kind of early access process and yeah this and here's the vision for where we're going with it you know they can they can you know see things are directional, you know, and, and just like, cust- like pro- you know, getting customers, testimonials with constant contact, you know, I went out and got four customers, people I didn't know to take the product. Two were tied to partners, which became, you know, I'll tell that, I'll tell you that in just a second, but so four, four prospects, people, you know, so I go to strategic partners or, or investors and they're like, Hey, do you have any references? I'm like, I'll give you three. And they're like, do you have any more? I'm like, I'll give you one more. You know, we only had four. You work with what you have, you know, no one asked for a fifth. Right? <laughs> Thank God. Don't tweet me. <laughs> but so, and two of those were tied in with, you know, my background is for scale is channels. And so, so my most success has been finding that where your target market's hanging out through channel partnerships, constant contact, 100% channels when we started and it stayed that way for many years, you know, until we were able to build up the flywheel of the business. You know, when you're charging free, a free trial and fifteen dollars a month, you, know, you can need a lot of customers with revenue to to get enough to be able to support, you know, you know your own marketing and and whatnot. So getting that flywheel going, you know, I we couldn't go door to door. That's right. You know, when people said to us, "How are you going to sell to small businesses? You're going to need an army of a hundred salespeople." We had none. You know, we went to partners and we had people that were warm lead sales folks that when they opened a trial, they called them within 48 hours and created a wow moment. They're like, I just signed up online and you're calling me. They're like, you know, you're my marketing coach. You want to help me how, how to make this a successful experience? Wow. You know, I can't even get my vendors that I pay, pay for service to do that. So we created wow moments, you know, with the, those folks. And, but, but it was all through channels that we were able to, in several of my most successful companies growing were channel, channel centric. What does that mean? Channels to, I don't, I know it's channel. What does that mean? Yeah. So looking for strategic partnerships where your target market's hanging out. So the one that we all share on the call, no matter what you do for a product or service is, association and member organizations. There's the association and member organizations. They're international, national, local, or regional, local. They're, they're event-oriented. They're, they're you know, thought leadership and education-oriented. But whatever you're focused on, there's the association of blah. 
and many of them that you could work with where your target market's hanging out and going to learn of new products, new services, new ways to do things. So that's one that we all share of a category. And there's, a, there's at least a minimum of 15 to 20 categories we each have in our, in our respective markets for, for complementary services that could use what we're providing, you know, consultants, influencers. So all of these are different categories of potential channel partners. And you do get on a whiteboard and think of like, where's all my, where's the target market hanging out? And look at the categories and who within the categories are the ones you would want to work with. And I'll tell you a constant contact. You know, when we sold the company, we had over 8,000 channel partners. And that's a conservative number because we counted chambers as one and we had 4,000 chambers. So like, you know, the numbers were staggering. But I set up the, all of the, the, this, the channel program and the, the go-to-market and we you know, just got everyone out there, Amex open to, you know, at the time they had 2 million small businesses and we were the, their selected, you know, digital marketing tool for their small businesses, right? So we would just sign agreements with these partners to make us available to guess what? Our target market that we shared. So, so channels is the answer for scale in every business. And most people don't think about that. But if you can leverage yourself with, through, and with partners that your tar- where your target market is hanging out, you know that gets you a lot of free advertising and marketing, and you just you agree to you know give them something when the sale occurs, you know. So so it's not paying for the marketing up front; it's getting something on the back end. So that's the answer. If you want the answer for scale, it's channels. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. <laughs> guarantee you. Money back guarantee on that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's the word that, I mean, I understand a channel, but as you applied it to the target audience, where they're hanging out, as, as a, you know, it's, as a, it's a clue as to how to market your product. You, you discovered that, obviously. Yeah, we had we had eight thousand partners in one hundred and fifty different categories. You know, so, you know, you can go really granular with it, or just go to the uber bigger groups. But it's you know it's an exercise to get on a whiteboard and and think of all the categories, and then in the category who are the top twenty, you know, so in associations in the association category, or you know, complementary services who are the top ones that are offering something that they could put you in the tool bag and sell along with theirs or, or integrate it in or. So is that the way you can use constant contact? You can talk to somebody and you say, okay, here's my target audience. Can I get the channel of email addresses to reach? Yeah. Them? So no, so, so constant contact is we would go to the channel partners to get two small businesses. But the, 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 the software itself was, you have to have a relationship with whoever you're marketing to. So they've either done business with you before, or they've explicitly signed up for, to receive a newsletter or what have you. So you're getting the information because, you're, because they're in a relationship. It's not a prospecting tool, if you will. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the... Uh, there, are other, there are other services that would, would allow prospecting. You know, we, we're always about, you know, a current customer... A current relationship of somehow, yeah. And by the way, spam is in the eye of the receiver. So if someone just sends something blindly to someone, these people, I'll sell you a million names for a penny and you go market to them. You know, the people that receive it don't know you and they and they can complain. And in some states, you'll get fined. Wow. You know, it's a, and there's a hefty fine, you know, for in some states. So... So you want to you wanna make sure you're, if you ever are going to market through a partner or someone's giving you a, a purchase list, the best thing is for them to send it on your behalf. Like here's one of our partners that has this great offering because they know them and they've signed up with them and now they're getting a, a message about you. If you go send it blindly, you know, that that's again, spams in the eye of the beholder. Like, why am I getting this? I don't know this company. I didn't give my email address. You know, so it's just something that's something we always you know, how to coach, coach people on. Yeah. Well, I certainly enjoyed meeting you. I, well, certainly I appreciate that. Appreciate that. I, I, uh, 
enjoyed meeting you as well. <laughs> Joe's a ton of fun. <laughs> Joe's my Joe's my Joe's the next one who, in my opinion, he's on his way to being a next sir. That's all I'm saying. He'll be the first one out of this group. So, uh, sir, sir Joe. Sir Joe, I have no doubt. You know, the song Sir Duke, it's Sir Joe. So it's all good. Thank you, David. There it is. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a ringing endorsement right there. Yeah, Joe, you got a lot to live up to, man. I'm just going to let you know that right now. So. Okay. No pressure, Joe. No pressure, Joe. <laughs> Maybe Louisa be a close second, but I'm going with Joe. That's all I'm saying. I, I would choose Louisa any day. Dame, Dame Louisa. <laughs> Dame Dame Louisa. Lady, lady, no, Lady Louisa. Lady Louisa. Lady Louisa. Lady Louisa. I like that. I love it. I would, I would offer my service to Lady Louisa. <laughs> you know, I'm very comfortable in that space. I think I would definitely welcome all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Sir Alex. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, it was great talking to everyone. And While we were talking, you know that uh, Warnock was awarded the uh, the election. Oh, he was. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, they were saying they were saying he's projected winner. Yeah, fifty-one forty-nine. Well, uh, can, you, can you imagine? There are still like a million four or five hundred thousand people that voted for Walker in Georgia. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, well, I mean, especially when it, he went off the rails a bit. Uh, oh, boy, did he. Oh, but I tell you, I, I had a lot of respect for him as an athlete. But then when I heard what he was saying, I was like, oh. I remember, you know, it was 1981 when it was him and, and, and Marcus Allen going for the Heisman Trophy. Oh, yeah. And I remember that really, really well. And I'm like, I was a total, a total Marcus Allen fan. And I've never, I, I'm staying that way to this day. <laughs> Yeah, well, rightfully so. Can yeah, you just, imagine that if, if, he, if that was your target audience? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my God. No, it's funny. It's funny. I, I've worked with several. So the, that was one of the things with Constant Contact. Uh, political campaigns, you know, we, we would shy away from because if you're, if you're part of the political party, you get the, the contact info in your district for anyone that, that, that donated. So they're like, all right, well, we're going to you know, get all those names. And we're going to send a message out to them. And, you know, and they, they didn't have any connection with them or any permission. It was they like they would give to the Democratic Party. But this Democratic person in some local area that's running starts messaging them, which they, you know, I don't know how many of you get your text messages and things from all these different candidates because oh, they get it from the yeah. party. Right. Oh, all it's the like, time. Oh, right. So, so with email marketing, that's spam. So. You know, I would, I mean, I just remember work, we were working with many of the folk, Joe Lieberman, like all these different folks on all sides of the aisle. And they they first want to know, like, what's, what was the company's position? And we're like, we're, we're independent. We're agnostic. Like we work with everyone. They, they want to make sure if we're working with like democratic, you know, candidates that we're not going to help Republican candidates. And I mean, it was just funny conversations with, with some of their campaign managers and, and we're like, let's start the conversation with we don't we don't allow you to use it if you're going to do, you know, take the the party information, mm-hmm. build your own list, you know, sure. And it was just it was uh, it was always it was always funny conversations. And then, of course, then there were also the all the, the news outlets and all the people that that, you know, many would use us. But then, you know, like we get customers saying I'm canceling the service because I got an email from. This, you know, this, you know, this news outlet that that I don't support, you know, and, and if, since you're supporting, I'm not paying for the service anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just funny, like how far it went down to people like I'm like, you know, they signed up and used the service like, you know, sorry, if you know, we don't, we're not going to tell people because you don't like them to stop <laughs> using the service. But anyway, just funny, funny stuff around the politics and what how far they go. And it shows up in every business. Yeah. 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 You know, if you put a sign out in front of you, you lose half the town from, from wanting to work with you. <laughs> it is fascinating, but it really, it, it just becomes about me being right, you being wrong. And then with the heels dug in and, and, and missing opportunities of connection. Like it's right. such a huge disconnection. Right. Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah, I've, I've, I've cut out, I mean, more so 
as of late between COVID and, and, uh, and the, all this political stuff just cut out, stop, you know, unfriending people on social that it's just like, I, I'm not, I don't get political. I just say agnostic and I won't say anything, you know, publicly, but some are so strong. And then I actually had someone write me we're like, I thought you were seeking the truth. And <laughs> I'm like, I don't need, I don't need any more videos from you. Like, I don't <laughs> stop sending me your videos. Like I thought you were seeking the truth. Yeah. The truth. <laughs> Gotta love people. Yes. Um, like delete. Yeah. So <laughs> yep. thank you again. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. So you guys have a great holiday season and you're planning for uh, you know for next year and and yeah. uh, good energy happy. in the mastermind here. So I love it. Maybe we can have you back on next year as we're going through our quarters to see how we're doing. Yes. That was, that was, <laughs> thank good. you, sir. <laughs> Sounds good. You have to book it through uh, just sitting right there. <laughs> Gentleman Bo. Hey, Bo. Oh, oh. Oh. So cute. <laughs> He's, he, he heard me. Hey, yeah. Gentleman Bo. <laughs> yeah, he'll have, to, uh, he'll have to approve that, but yeah, sure. Okay. We okay. are so grateful. Thank you. My so pleasure.